Hi guys, um, welcome to my new channel. It's called Psy Revolution. Um, basically, I'm going to be discussing current topics in ecology, evolution, animal behavior, and anything else that uh, I find interesting or that you find interesting and you request that I review, which would be awesome so that I could have some input from you guys. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm basically going to take a paper that's been recently published, hopefully that week or that month at least. Um, well, most of the time. It all depends, uh, whatever I decide to do. But, uh, so, um, what else was I going to say? Yeah, I can't remember what else I was going to say. Uh, well, let's just get into it. So, the first paper I'm going to do is... Um, by Goldberg et al. Um, it's called Species Selection Maintains Self-Incompatibility. Alright, Species Selection Maintains Self-Incompatibility. Uh, so th what this paper is about is um, the family Solidacea, I think, something like that. It's, uh, it was anyways, it's a nightshade family and it includes tomatoes, potatoes, tobacco, um, and hundreds of other species. Um, and these plants are hermaphroditic, so they have pollen and they also have flowers. Um, I'll, some of them can self-fertilize and some of them can't. So it's called either self-compatible or self-incompatible. Um, self-compatible plants can basically fertilize their own flowers with their own pollen. Self-incompatible plants cannot fertilize their own flowers with their own pollen because if the pollen gets in there, um, basically genetically they're incompatible. So there's a certain locus and it's highly polymorphic. Um, and if the pollen has um, the pollen's haploid and the um, the seeds are diploid. So if the pollen has either um, has the same polymorphic allele as either of the diploid alleles in the seed, then it's incompatible automatically and it won't fertilize. Um, so the interesting thing about this locus is that it's maintained over really long um, evolutionary time periods. So um, it's because of, um, well, it's thought to be because of free, uh, negative frequency dependent selection. So it's sort of a form of balancing selection where um, if you have a really common allele, you're at a disadvantage because your, um, the, your potential mates are less. Um, because anytime you meet somebody else, anytime your pollen goes to another plant that has that um, same common allele, um, it's incompatible. Whereas real, rare alleles are going to be highly favorable because... Um, they're going to increase the number of available partners. And then the next generation, if that, say, that rare, particular rare allele um, was really successful, um, then, um, then all the, a lot of the, there's going to be a skew in the offspring where a lot of them have that, uh, um, that rare, formerly rare allele, which is now not so rare, and then, um, which is going to favor the other, say, more common allele that was previously more common. So that kind of balances itself out so that these polymorphisms are maintained over really long periods of time, whereas usually in, um, you know, polymorphisms are either fixed by drift or lost by drift or fixed by selection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is kind of a situation where these, this locus can remain polymorphic for a really long time, indefinitely, maybe. Um, it's, it's maintaining the diversity at that allele. Um, so something that happens quite frequently is that in these plants is that they um, evolve selfing. So um, they basically started out as incompatible. And um, what happens quite often is they become self-compatible. And um, it has short-term advantages in that, um, you know, mate, 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 Finding a mate is difficult, so if you can mate with yourself, that's obviously uh, um, a big advantage. Um, it has long-term disadvantages, though, because uh, 
of inbreeding. We all know that inbreeding is bad. It you know, reduces diversity at a whole bunch of different uh, loci and reduces your ability to adapt and um, can cause you to fix um, deleterious mutations and not be able to clear those deleterious mutations, et cetera, et cetera. I think everybody knows that um, selfing is not, in the long term, the best strategy, maybe. Um, so here's their kind of their model. They built this really extensive phylogeny with like eight genes from 600 different species, and then they assigned them as either self-compatible or self-incompatible. Um, and then they, kind of, they modeled um, basically with a, I think they said it was a, um, a Markov model. So it's basically like a random kind of, uh, I assume it's some sort of random genetic drift model, um, and then they assigned a rate of self-incompatible to self-compatible, um, and a, uh, probably based on the phylogeny, I'm not really sure about that. Um, and then the rate of self-compatible to self-incompatible is zero because um, they don't have any evidence that that ever happens. If it happens, it's very rare. So once they become self-compatible, they can't evolve self-incompatibility again. Um, and so as it turns out, there's actually more self-compatible members. Um, about 60% of this family is self-compatible and 40% is self-incompatible. So you might think right off the bat that self-compatibility is favored evolutionarily and because there's more um, species that are self-compatible. Um, but with their analysis, what they basically figured out is that um, that um, even though self-compatible plants tend to speciate faster, they also tend to go extinct faster. Um, so the net diversification rate is higher in self-incompatible plants um, than it is in self-compatible plants. Um, so what I think is kind of interesting about that paper is, um, I guess the different time scales kind of like, um, so self-compatibility arises really fast and it has a high speciation rate, um, probably because I'm imagining a self-compatible plant probably mates with itself most of the time, which is going to lead to reproductive isolation and, um, basically it won't be mating with any other members of the family and kind of will drift away from them and eventually become with incompatible with other species and be a species unto itself. Um, in general, that's probably what happens. Um, so even though it has a much higher speciation rate, the net diversification rate is much lower. So sort of, even though it's branching much more frequently, it's also being sort of trimmed off much more frequently. So, um, I guess the idea is species level selection is causing this self-incompatibility locus to be maintained over really long, long periods of time, um, even though the self-compatibility is sort of diversifying faster and, um, you know, acquiring species faster and, um, has certain short-term advantages. So um, that's what I thought was interesting. Um, let me know what you guys think. Uh, sorry if that was boring. I, I know the slideshow part was really boring. <laughs> I'm going to try and do better next time. I just uh, I don't have a, a whole lot of time right at this moment. Um, so please leave me a comment. Um, subscribe. Um, uh, leave me a comment telling me what you thought was interesting about that paper. Um, what, do you th what do you think about this idea about uh, different levels of selection, like species level selection versus selection, um, you know, as we normally think about it. Um, um, and also leave me a comment if you have a paper that you uh, you think is interesting or you want to see me um, do. So thanks.